and we're clear. Action. Welcome back to the Monday Morning Cup Show. This is Carl. I am joined by Mahoney. And this is the first remote episode of the Monday Morning Cub Show. It is April 15th. The Cubs are 9-6. and six. They're in third place in the NL Central. 3-3 three and three on a nine-game West Coast road trip. Three games coming up against the Arizona Diamondbacks starting tonight. I feel amazing about the 2024 Cubs. I couldn't feel better myself. This team is so much better than I thought. I thought they would be good. I thought they would be competent, professional, give you good at-bats, consistent games. This looks like a 95-win team, and I know we've said that before, but they they look special. And I wanted to add just the fact that we had some skepticism going with the, the way the schedule was structured, and regardless of how good they are, you know that's going to be tough for any ball club. But the way that they've performed has me feeling super optimistic You know, on this Monday morning, baby. How about it? And you can say 3-3 three and three on paper and start to feel, you know, I don't know if this is – if you follow the storylines and the way the Cubs got to three and three in the past week, hell of a rebound, multiple rebounds. We're going to talk about some West Coast rebounds. Uh, we put together a couple segments, favorite things about the team so far. Mahoney's got a classic baller strike. You know he's going to give it to us. We've got an, an Anthony Rizzo versus Michael Bush comparison segment that I'm going to walk people through. I, I'm very excited to do that. I, I'm very intrigued. And, and then old school red line radio days, you know, we would just go off for like 30, 40 minutes and extremely nuanced stuff. I put together a bunch of nuanced observations about the pitching staff, the bullpen, bullpen leverage index. So as we sit here on April 15th, we feel very good about the Cubs. And the show we put together, it's remote. It's our first remote show. We want to be in person as much as we can. Mahoney, your kid got baptized in the Catholic Church today, though. So it's like 1 a.m. as we're doing this. You know, things get delayed, but family comes first. Congratulations to Liam. Hey, blessed. It was sunny, 80 degree, perfect day today. And we got a Cubs win. Cubs winner, right? Yep, exactly. That you took the words out of my mouth. Who is the godfather? Tell tell the audience about the godparents. Uh, we got godfather Jamie Manning. He is my brother-in-law from Ireland, a county Leitrim. So it is uh, North Ireland, not in Northern Ireland. However, you know, he had moved to Australia, met my sister-in-law, all was kismet. Uh, couldn't be more proud to have him as the godfather. And then my sister, uh, Megan Muggs Mahoney, is the godmother. So they did their duty today, fulfilled. Um, you know, just couldn't have been prouder of, of everyone. And it, it was a, a awesome, wonderful day and great experience. It's beautiful. Really is a beautiful thing, guys. Like we said, family comes first. And the Cubs aren't far behind, though. And we got a lot of stuff to talk about with the Cubs. So congratulations to William, but also congratulations to the Cubs. We talked about the West Coast rebounds. I I do have some wrinkles here for this episode, too, on YouTube. If you're listening on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, I'd encourage you to check out the visuals because we, we've installed a video switchboard here, and this should be pretty dynamic with some of the statistics. I've prepared about 10 graphics that we're going to be referencing throughout the show today. Now, if you are listening to this and you can't watch, I should, I should also say we are introducing new programming piloted Monday night, where I'm going to do an in-game Carl cast, and I've prepared a bunch of statistics and segments and stuff. So this is the only very formal announcement I'll say. Check this out. It's Monday night. I'm going to try and run it back again on Tuesday night with the idea of Monday through Thursday games. I want to do a Carl cast. Now, the Carl cast would be in-game. This is an in-game experience. Uh, It's not to replace a broadcast. It's just merely extra substance. I'm not Peyton Manning but I, I do know a lot. We're going to chart pitches on defense and be very serious. When the comes are in the field, it will be a very serious experience. Talk about what's coming, what's happening. Chess, chess game. Like you are in a dugout. Because when you are in a dugout and the boys are in the field, uh, it's very tense in the dugout. When the bats are up, when the boys are off the field, vibes are very high. So I put together nine segments that I'll carry through this broadcast. First inning, we'll do Wikipedia, girlfriend, background information on a starting pitcher. I think the fifth inning, we're going to drink a beer together with the chat. Like there's, there's a bunch of different little stuff I'm trying out. So thank you very much for sitting through this announcement as I, I know we have a lot to get into with the Cubs, but this Carl casting game thing, you and I talked a lot. I'm not, I haven't even like teased this. This is the baby. This thing's going to be, Amazing, Mahoney. I'm telling you. Let, you. let me just hit you with a little fucking graphic real quick. 
I'm interested at the fact that it's not going to be a stale sit and watch. That thing will be, you know, keeping people on their toes throughout the length of the game. Carl cast. And I'll point out for those of you watching on YouTube, you will have just noticed the first cut to the first graphic. I botched it. I'm not editing it out though. Here's a little teaser though. We're going to talk Michael Bush, Anthony Rizzo. We are picture in picture bottom left here. That's a teaser. Let's get back to the, let's get back to the schedule though. Let's do a state do- of the union on the Chicago Cubs. Carl, take us to water. Guys, this team is eight and one when they score four or more runs. They're built to beat left-handed pitching, but they've only had two of their 15 games so far have been against left-handed starters. This is a team, though, on paper, bunch of righties, guys that can smash it out of the ballpark from the right side against left-handed pitching. Splits favor them very well. They're still lying. So the schedule has been not good, extremely competitive. Going on the road to face the Padres, you see how good that lineup is. The Mariners turn around with their run prevention. It's a great organization relative to major league average. They're a great organization right now. The Mariners play consistent baseball. And I said, Padres are electric. They get you. They're going to get you. And so to come out three and three right now, after taking the series from the Dodgers, I think as a Cubs fan, you Justin Steele's hurt. We've got questions. People want to complain about the bullpen. We've got a new guy at first base. We're not really sure what's going over at third base. Cody Ballinger has been bad, guys. Cody Bellinger has been bad. Pete Crow Armstrong has 17 strikeouts and 55 plate appearances by the time we record this. So I don't, I don't even know what the hell is going on with that. We've had bad base running. We've made mistakes in the infield. And as we sit here, the Cubs are third in runs per game in Major League Baseball, ninth in on-base percentage, eighth in isolated slugging, which is one of my favorite statistics. And the Cubs don't even have guys that, like a Kyle Schwarber isolated slugging guy. Six in a home run rate. Six in home run rate without any true, again, major home run threats in the lineup. And last thing, Mahoney, which I think is unbelievable, is the walk to strikeout rate. They're second in walk rate. They're ninth in strikeout rate. That's the second best ratio in baseball behind the New York Yankees. And how about, fuck it, let's just take it one more step. You want to really talk about how strategic the 2024 Cubs are? And I'm rolling, baby. I told I told you this would be... Old school red line radio here where I'm just going off because I love this team. The Cubs have only attempted four stolen bases on a season, which is the second. I mean, the Cardinals are second to last. They've attempted seven. They've stolen four bases. The Cubs do not and will not swipe bags this year, it appears. However, the Cubs rank second in base running statistics in Major League Baseball, taking extra bases. So what I'm seeing is a team that's taking heavy secondary leads, not risking the out. It seems like this is some cohesive strategy from the front office to say we're not giving up outs. Even though they've given up outs on the bases, say Suzuki keeps running into them. But a wholesale fundamental shift to say we're not swiping bags, we're stolen bases are up in this era with the pitch clock because of timing, you can't pick over. So that is a very interesting wrinkle that I found in the statistical dive to say this Cubs lineup, there's no stolen bases. It just speaks volumes about the quality of the at bat. Like why would you run into and out on the bases? Just get a good secondary because ball's getting put in play and it's getting hit hard. You know, the on-base percentage is high. We don't need to be manufacturing and taking uh, unnecessary risk. State of the Union. Yeah, no, dude, just quick couple quick follow-ups. And that's to me, is like a glaring statistic that they've only stolen or had however many attempts. And I haven't even come close to noticing that. That's why I think why I was so shocked about it. And it's because I'm paying attention to such good at-bats. So one thought there. Uh, the other thought I had, and kind of going back to what you had mentioned about we're a team that's built to beat left-handed pitching and – we're still performing well up to this point in the season. And we haven't had that advantageous part of our schedule or when we'll hit those stretches where we're going to be able to explode a bit more. So that makes me feel even better um, about where we're at. And I appreciate that rundown and, and that sprint through. Hey, how about the schedule? You can look at a major league baseball season and say it's 26 weeks. One of those weeks is the all-star week, you know, throw that out. 
But for the most part, you've got 25, 24 weeks to play with. Now, if we just look at the first week, you know, that's why I say opening week's kind of tough because you have the three game series with the Raiders, but just treat that as its own. That's mm-hmm. tough to go down and open up in Texas without coming home after spring training. That's the team packing their shit up from Arizona and going right. right to Texas and playing yeah. a three-game set against the defending World Series champions. That's tough. It's a great lineup. They lose the series. All right, then you come home, no off day, seven straight. You got four against the Rockies. No, I take this back. You have three against the Rockies with an off day into three against the Dodgers. You go five and one in the homestand. It's a great week, Mahoney. Yeah, dude. It's a great week, Okay. Third week of the season, which is what we're recapping here. The games against the Padres, the games against the Mariners. Is it great? On paper, in totality, need your reaction. Hey, yeah, they could have been four and two. They blew the first game, but they salvaged. They salvaged three and three. They have momentum coming in the next week. So to the extent we can avoid these bad weeks, and to the extent that, you know, we as Cubs fans can Look at the week and react to stuff throughout, you know, as a week. We're much better off. We're much better off as fans. I hope people are mad about bullpen, some bullpen stuff. We get questions about starting pitching. But from a week to week basis, guys, that first week's tough going out of Texas. They rebound magnificently going five and one. This nine game stretch we're talking about, very tough. And they have shown twice throughout the stretch they've rebound magnificently. Dude, I, I'm so. gonna be honest with you too. It's changed like a lot for me breaking things up and looking at like at a week by week basis as opposed to, you know, just living not not particularly pitch by pitch because I can't do that. But even just living and dying by a headline. Like now that I'm looking at things, it's like, all right, here we are, here what we have, and you know, here's what's what. I don't know. So let's do West Coast rebounds here. What are we about ten minutes in? And I'm gonna make our first legitimate um, video switch here. So if you guys aren't watching this on YouTube, check this out. Those of you that have subscribed on YouTube, appreciate it. Keep showing some support. We're going to keep adding little tricks here. Uh, but if I go over to camera, let's let's go to the still shot here and pull up the schedule because I want to talk about the schedule in detail. Picture in picture, baby. Now in the column, we've got dates. Of games, we've got the teams. We've got six games here: three against San Diego, three against Seattle. You'll see there's three and three. I want to call out attendance. The Cubs' attendance. They had a gif, gif, a clip from the Seattle game three today of the W flags waving behind the away team dugout, and it was remarkable to see how many Cubs fans show up. And I, I just think it's just the beginning. You know, like the, even if they're a 500 team. People show up for him on these West Coast trips, but you just keep waiting, man. This is this is a squad that's going to get the national base to get off their butt cheeks and go see him on these trips. So that's a super high level encouraging thing. It's just the national support that the boys have when they go on the road. Got to say that. Yeah, not just from the fans already there, but there's going to be people making destination trips, you know, around the squad. I'm already thinking about it. If I'm not going to Punta Cana in May, which will be our next remote from the beach, May 12th. If I'm not there, I mean, we instantly I'm looking at PNC road trips. Instantly thinking about a Cincinnati and July trip or August or whatever that is. A lot of good opportunities here at this Cubs team before football OTAs and college football season starts to get on the road. In division, Milwaukee save a couple bucks. They're playing well. Now, as we look at this graphic here, guys, I just want to say two things about West Coast rebounds from this week. Blowing game one, tragic. Up 8 nothing, Tragic. Coming out of the rain delay on Sunday against the Dodgers. Exhausting rain delay. So for them to come out and just hang eight runs on you, Darvish, and jump out of that felt so good. And then to surrender that, lose it. You know, Tati sits at home run off Alzale. It's his first appearance in the eighth inning with Craig Council. Council loves a closer who can pitch in the eighth inning in a tie game, you know, pitch with the lead, I should say. And so that was Alzale's first moment in the closer role coming into the eighth inning this season. Gives up the bomb to Tatis. I mean, this that sinks you. And then they show up on 
Tuesday and they win 5-1. Clean game. Clean fucking game. Just come out and win 5-1. What a rebound. What a rebound after blowing 8 nothing. Yeah, that could be that could have been pretty defeating for a clubhouse. But go back to this lineup, Molly. Character. This clubhouse is on to the next pitch. Pitch by pitch. Now I want to point out again, they lose two in a row after that game. So you want to talk about five? <laughs> Will hole in the sale there, guys. And they bounce back. 4-1, 3-2 wins. Javier Assad pitching his fucking balls off. Trying to watch the F word here, guys. But, you know, he goes out, gives you a good start after the rain delay. The Cubs are 4-1 and one since Justin Steele got injured. And game started by Javier Assad and whoever is pitching for Justin Steele. So I don't know how, what statistic we're calling for that, but I want people to keep their eye on this. That's that's exactly where the difference is going to get made with this roster while Justin Steele's out. And I know he's making rehabs. We're going to get to the pitching staff, but just some high-level observations about the week, the rebound situation here. This is a big storyline about this clubhouse. What would then be your favorite thing about the 2024 Cubs, either a player in particular or something very specific about this team that jumps out that really warms Mahoney's heart. I've mentioned it before. I think it's that collective approach, but it's the offense as a whole and and the team approach and the way that they've been able to kind of boost up and, and put numbers when maybe our bullpen has faltered here and there. That's given me confidence to where, you know, I'm not really worried about, you know, the tired and the stress that may be on the bullpen, you know, after, a long road trip or whichever it is. The fact that the offense is there and they're going to be pushing forward, I think is going to give our staff overall more confidence. You know, the hitter feels better. The pitcher feels better. Pitcher feels better. The hitter feels better. There is this symbiotic, you know, the left hand washes the right hand, but they both wash the face. It's all a little Jim Grazia. Yeah, dude, for sure. And to have that confidence when you go on the mound that you know your lineup, they're not taking the night off ever. You're going to get your runs. You're going to get your quality at bats. Where I think there's been times before pitchers take them out on this team. And, you know, we got to do a lot. We're going to strike out 14 times tonight. You know, we may not get that cricket number on the scoreboard. And that just really impacts, you know. Yeah. Like we're talking about margins. Too. Stopper. Hey, it impacts your confidence and your approach to it. I also think it's important as Cubs fans, baseball fans in general, when we talk about this game, we're talking about the margins and the nuance. You know, all these players are remarkable athletes, the best of the best. It's so hard if you watched the most average Major League Baseball player next to an all-star do a workout. Just go fucking take rounders, hit BP. And like, go ahead, tell me what you really think is the difference in the separator between watching these two guys work out. It's nearly impossible. You have to put them in so many game situations and ask these players to react and have so many different, I guess, the body of work has to be there for you to really draw substantive judgment about the quality of a baseball player, which is my long-winded way of saying, my favorite thing about this team, I think, think individually I don't see superstars I think as an aggregate they do their job so well and there aren't guys trying to do more than what they're capable of say Suzuki and Ian Happ are like shining examples of that like Ian Happ plays his game Ian Happ does not show up to the field trying to hit 40 runs Ian Happ is just like I'm going to get mine I'm going to hit the ball hard I play good left field you know, say Suzuki's still yeah. a little too aggressive on the base pass is for me, but they're just two solid players or exemplary of what this identity is. Now I'm going to spit back Mike Talkman. What was the statistic you saw? Um, Touch most pitches seen per at bat in the bigs with, I think, 300 minimum plate appearances or something of that nature. So it's that goes back to that like collective approach. And like, what does that say as well about the health of a clubhouse? where there might not be, you know, a two superstars as opposed to, you know, right. s- seven dogs, right? 
right? The one through seven that the Cubs have rolled out on a day-to-day basis not seem to change. They're going to plug and play in the eight spot. You know, is that a talkman? Is it Garrett Cooper only see some left-handed pitching? Nick Madrigal's coming off the bench now in defensive replacement. Seems like Morell's really settling in the third on a day-to-day. Yeah. Now, on YouTube, we've pulled up the statistic, the general hitting statistics for the 2024 Cubs. These are not baseball references and update them until morning. So these are not current for the Seattle game, but close enough. And what I have highlighted here is the walk to strikeouts. And there's four really good walk to strikeout ratios. Nico Horner has nine walks to seven strikeouts. Ian Happ, 11 walks, 14 strikeouts. It's a high rate, but 11 offsets it. Cody Bellinger, seven walks, 11 strikeouts. And then Mike Talkman, eight walks, four strikeouts. Extremely rare. A double up is like a Yogi Bear. Shit. That's, that has not happened anymore. Uh, that's obviously going to change. He's not going to have a two to one throughout the course of the season. Um, you know, you have a Michael Bush, six walks, 12 strikeouts. You've got a lot of high walk guys here that offsets, even if there is a higher striker, right? The Cubs don't strike out that much. But this just, again, we're talking about take what you get in big leagues. If you get in the box trying to create, you're fucked. These guys are so good. But if you are the type of reactionary discipline hitter, you got a stack of these guys, one through seven. It, you know, we're, we're at the point where we're just saying maybe Dansby needs to hit higher in the lineup or to say you need to hit with more guys on base. And that's a great place to live where you're talking about where to shuffle guys within a one through seven. We're not talking about different players. We're not talking about anything other than optimizing these seven guys one through one through seven when you have to switch it up or whatever i'm not plug and play is not the term but the you have the same makeup of an individual you know that you're going to be able to to throw in those situations and when we have to fill in here and there you know with the townsman and, and so on yeah ta- hey talkman's ready to play Pete crow arms yeah. not guys that's a big difference right now mike talkman 30 year old man pride of talent he's ready to play baseball every single day um Another key thing, Nico Horner has not been great. He's slugging 195, yet still has drawn nine walks. Tells me the approach is there. Discipline's there. He's not changing anything. His timing may be off a little bit. His rhythm may be off a little bit. But general zone presence and his understanding of what pitchers are trying to do to him, the, all those pieces are put together. So he's a guy where you could show up one day and, you know, he had a hot week, hit 600 one week, you know, player of the week type stuff. Like that, that's a breakout candidate, top to bottom, when I look at the performance so far. Keep your eye on Nico Warner. Let's talk, let's talk to Anthony Rizzo versus Michael Bush, too. Yeah, please. This, I'm th- very intrigued. This is, way, this is way too aggressive, but we have to give credit to Michael Bush for homering in four straight games. And I want to give credit to Michael Serrani, too, from Bleacher Nation. I'm going to cut to this. Who he pulled out? Uh, Michael Bush's rankings among rookies. He's third in Major League Baseball rookies, first nationally with 170 weighted runs straight plus. He's 70% better than an average Major League hitter right now. He leads rookies in home runs, leads NL rookies in RBIs, He's on pace for a nine war season, 93 miles per hour exit velocity. Guy's absolutely just fortune baseball. Now, part of the reason, if we look at his spray chart, oh, here we, we pull go. Up some of the stat cast information, this is good shit here. You're, gonna, you're just going to see like he lives in the top 10 percentile. So far, through his first, whatever, 55, 60 plate appearances. And the only issue with him right now is his swing and miss. He's just swing and miss. And plate discipline's there, knows the zone, drives the ball when he makes contact. Thumper, pull heavy. Just yeah, a guy dude. we don't have. I could see his back end out in front very quick. That's one thing I can notice. We're very optimistic about the future of Michael Bush. Dynamic-looking athlete. 
I would just give you a quick background on him. 31st overall pick, I believe 2019 draft from the Dodgers. He went to North Carolina. He was a middle of the order, power bat at North Carolina, struggled as a freshman, played in the Cape Cod League, got better. And then I want to say, you know, might have hit 300, 330 in the ACC, bunch of home runs. Dodgers take him 31st overall. The problem with the Dodgers is they have so many good position players between Freddie Freeman and Mookie Betts. Uh, Max Muncy, Chris Taylor. There's not a lot of plate appearances available for a corner and fielder with the Dodgers. You you, re- you really just have to be you have to be better than I just named some of the best players yeah, in the National seriously. League. Seriously, so that's where the opportunity came from with the Cubs. They traded Jackson Ferris, who's a second rounder, left handed, big frame, you know, tall, thin kid, kind of looks like a young Cole Hamels. They traded him this off season, and I think. There was missed optimism. Like people could have been higher on Michael Bush. The problem was he had a slow debut with the Dodgers and just he had a cup of coffee with them last year. Again, this isn't a system that really like you can come up here and play every day, develop at the big league level. So it's a completely different environment for Bush with the Cubs. And he's thrived so much far exceeded expectations. And I'm not talking even if he didn't homer in four straight games, just purely from a present standpoint. He looks great in the box. I love the power without having to carry all the extra weight. That is, you know, we talk about back issues, lower body issues, staying healthy. Some of the body types on this Cubs team, so healthy. And I look at Bush, it's, you get the same sets when you look at dance, but you see an athlete. You see somebody yep. who's flexible, durable, dexterous. Definitely, yeah. dude. So then they're just loaded up and down the lineup with guys like that. So it's not just Bush having the power being a Paul heavy guy. It's just, there's a lot of other, these nuanced marginal things about him that I, I find extremely valuable. And he's getting his first full-time reps as a first baseman, you know, in the big leagues. I, he played some first base with the Dodgers in the minor league system, but they weren't developing him as a first baseman because you wouldn't if Freddie Freeman was your first baseman. Good shit. Thank you. Now we are going to talk about this too. Is he Anthony Rizzo? Is he Anthony Rizzo? Again, if you're watching this on YouTube, you'll see a graphic here that explains the Baseball America (laughs) prospect rankings for Michael Bush and Anthony Rizzo, and you'll see they're nearly identical to each other in the years before they broke into the big leagues. Baseball Prospectus had Bush 71, they had Rizzo 75. Baseball America had him 43, they had Rizzo 47. It's not that far off. No, those numbers would average out. The difference is Anthony Rizzo won a World Series for the Cubs. The difference is Anthony Rizzo, you know, posted 4.7 wins above replacement in his first full seven seasons with the Cubs. His first four full seasons with the Cubs are four of the best first four seasons anybody's had with the Cubs since Ernie Banks played with Ron Sano. So we're drawing lofty comparisons when we talk about Michael Bush, but what of I've course. seen. Is not anything to say. Can't be. He can't. Be, he can be Anthony Rizzo, folks. He he can be every bit of Anthony Rizzo. That's what I think. Then I'll take it. Well, long way to go. <laughs> this is that's the type of thing I. And you get beat up for saying that stuff. That's I mean, it's but a I'm legend. being serious. Now let's get out. Let's get out of the graphic for a second. Come back. Level set. Um. I don't want to put these expectations on Anthony, or I mean, on. I don't want to put these expectations on Michael Bush unnecessarily, but I think it's a fair comparison. I think that's how people should be considering him. Don't say these are the expectations and this is who he has to be, but in the long run. Do I ball or strike? I'll ball or strike it. Let's do it. Let's get into ball or strike. Ball or strike. Michael Bush. Better than Rizzo. Ball. Outside. All right. But but not not a real bad. It was just some sh- bad timing, bad mechanics. It's a ball. You know, again, Anthony Rizzo won a, won a World Series, played on a broken ankle, was an all-star when nobody was an all-star. Set the culture for these young guys to come up and bump. Fit in with Lester and Lackey when nobody fits in with Lester and Lackey. Like, this is, we're talking about legendary figure in that clubhouse. Hey, Michael Bush through his first 15 big league games looks pretty fucking good. And if you're pretty good in big leagues, you can fit into that clubhouse, pal. On to that, then. Ball or strike. This team's only getting better. Ball or strike. Ah, strike down the middle. 
Piping Fastball. Hot. 96. It's only in there. Craig Council is learning every day. Bullpen strengthens itself every day, even in failure. This bullpen strengthens itself. And the team is going to continue to come together. The more you win close games and the more you lose close games, the more you go through close game experiences, the better off you're going to be. Now, someone would say that is obvious. However, since the Cubs unloaded from the Theo core, you know, we've gone through seasons where you have stretches of non competitive play may last multiple games where you're just not in it. You just, just you go out, take the field against Braves, and game's over in the third inning. And so the difference with this team is I think you're going to see significantly less stretch and runs of that. So I would say strike, the team is getting better, and they're modeled for continuous improvement throughout the season. All right, hell yeah. All right, shifting gears a little bit, but ball or strike, ball or strike, Shota Imanaga, his ERA record for the Cubs is a big deal. <laughs> it's a ball. That's a ball. Zero point zero. Shota's not giving up. A, yeah, he's not giving up an earned run. Huge deal. How many innings is it spanned? 15 and a third? Three starts. Yeah, he's got the, the, the rain delay against the Dodgers. Shota. We talked about this in the preseason preview. Could be too good for the season, which would then make people a little too kooky about how good he can be. But maybe I was maybe I was dead ass wrong because I'm going to show you guys here. Shota, his fastball grades out in it is in the 100th percent. There is it's the best fastball in Major League Baseball right now, and I don't mean that lightly. If you're watching this on YouTube, you see the MLB percentile rankings. His fastball run value is it's 100. It is the highest that it can be um, through his first three starts. And that was something people had talked a lot about Showtime when they signed him was the four-seam fastball and how difficult it is to hit because it looks so much different than what you would expect it to look like. Not because it's fast, not because it dives and dips and dodges and ducks, because what you would expect that ball to do and what it actually does is more different than almost any other fastball in Major League Baseball. Another guy who does it is Justin Steele. But so early initial reaction to show that he has a huge advantage because these guys haven't seen him. There's no scout or no not not that much data. So a thing to follow with him is will the fastball hit um, any major notes of regression? That there's going to be starts that aren't great. But are you going to see two, three starts in a row where it's like, hey, is, is he is he losing the fastball? Are people catching up to? Are the people catching up to what it's doing and evolving to the pitch? It's great stuff from him out of the gate, though. Comes in polished, picks up the ball, beats the Dodgers in a swing swing game on Sunday, beats the Mariners in a swing game on a Sunday. So last last two times out, folks, we gave Showtime the ball. We're like, hey, if you want to go out, win this start for us, would be huge for the team. Huge, huge picks up. Um, and he goes out and he delivers. I said swing games. It was Saturday against the Mariners. He went out. But a little, de- little, little long-winded here about Shota in the baller strike segment, Mahoney. But One more baller strike. While I've been thinking about it, Kyle Hendricks, he needs to be replaced. Yeah, I mean, this is strike, guys. This is strike 96, tough. 97. Tough right. This is... You didn't. You did not think he would just throw you the curveball on O two right down the middle of the plate. You just watched him, Carlos Beltran in the two thousand six NLCS against Adam Wainwright. I don't have a choice. I just took it for a strike here. Kyle Hendricks just. There's no. We don't. I didn't see it coming, but we can't really mess around here because we have a cushion for the team to develop and grow its identity throughout the course of the season. But if I look at the team. In September, and I don't really see a spot for Kyle Hendricks there. Then right now, I have to be honest about it and say, is it Ben Brown's turn? Now, that's a lot of pressure for Ben Brown to fill mm-hmm. in for Kyle Hendricks. Yeah. J- Jamison Tayon's coming back, and you know maybe that's a spot for him. It, it really sucks not having Justin Steele because, you know, as we replace Justin Steele, asking to replace the guy who started game two of the season – 
you know, these are depth issues you want to confront later in the season. You don't want to be talking about it in mid April. But Kyle Hendricks was terrible. It was terrible. I don't see how it get in years before it would be he gets rocked in April because he can't control the movement on his two seam. He's got to get he's got to get settled in and find his rhythm and timing. But like the magic just isn't. Yeah, dude. There would be back in the day. His style of pitching would be hard for me to watch just because it looked like any team would be able to jump all over him. But then over the course of the season, you saw he was just, you know, master. And then now it's just very, it's very scary. Um, would you emotionally be okay? Like, how does that, how does it work if we have to get rid of Kyle Hendricks? You know, he can't I, go to the bullpen. He can't be a long reliever. So what do we do with Kyle Hendricks if we have to get rid of him? Hopes fans are not going to like this. They're not going to like it, but I think in or. Sometimes we do have to kind of sever the past uh, to move forward here to the future. Um, you know, the last I, he's the last dude from 2016. That's a long time ago. Um, and he's not doesn't have that kind of stuff that's going to be. Shoving down people's throats, we know what he has, and if it's that not going to be able to, I don't know, you know, better than I do. I don't know. It, it, it's something that would suck, but I think where we're at as an organization and what we have, you know, within our, you know, pitching farm and what have you, uh, I think it's something that we're going to have to do in order to get to where we need to be. And you're just, we have to accept it. That's part of it. Yeah. You know, we've got so many great moments with Kyle Andrews. He's a gangster. He's awesome. He's the poster boy for when Jack was rebuilding the team and he just took the five year, 55 million, you know, and all the drama with Rizzo's contract. All the drama. There's some drama about so many players that are coming on out of the Theo era, and then Hendricks is like, "Yeah, I'll just stick around here. I'm not gonna look for any more money." You know, he hasn't played well in this contract, particularly the last. It's just just been kind of kind of tough. But then the reason it's tough is because there's so many great moments. The reason it's tough is because there's a stretch where he is top five in the National League in ERA over like a four or five season stretch. There's it's tough because he balled out in the playoffs for us when necessary. In in but for Joe Madden early trigger game seven, the legacy for Kyle Hendricks could be stronger. He'd be even stronger than a, a World Series champion. It is sad, and I credit to Theo because or I should say not credit to Theo, but what's tough is Kyle Hendricks is the last true Theo intelligent acquisition you know they drafted ian hap eighth overall in 2017 you know so whatever 16 15 16 they traded for kyle Hendricks from the texas rangers and he's a 10th rounder from dartmouth and he was kind of coming up as a you know as a crafty crafty prospect so theo made the move for him and it's been outstanding. But if you're watching this on YouTube, you'll see he's given up 26 hits in 12 and two thirds innings, a 12 ERA, a 2.4 whip. Are you put down almost two and a half guys per inning pitched? Five home runs in three starts. Ugh. Not good. And a quick random question. So when evaluating a pitcher like Hendricks, who doesn't have like overpowering velocity, or, you know, probably spin rate and what have you. I'm thinking of it's harder to judge when somebody like him falls off because he's more of the, you know, meticulous mental approach to to pitching as opposed to somebody who's like their fastball is gone. They're done. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, I think it's harder to tell because you're waiting to see, can he just turn it back? Because if it's finesse and it's mastery of the strike zone and changing speeds, then logic would say that's an easier thing to recover than fastball loss. Kyle Hendricks is, is a dying breed, though, in this game. Maybe they come back in the way the rule changes and we'll see how injuries develop. And this is like a decades long evaluation thing. Like, where does pitching go in the game? Does it continue down this max effort, velocity, stuff, depth? Or does it revert back to being able to control? a baseball game for seven, eight innings. And the league would have to continue to put in rule changes that would foster that, that would make that more important. We'll see how that happens. But as it stands, the days of having a filthy changeup and a good two-seamer 
and just being a gangster in the strike zone like Kyle Hendricks has made his career. I, I think the swing changes, I think the evolution of hitters' approaches and the consistency in which you're seeing hitters go up in the box and say, oh, I don't need to hit for high average. I'm willing to hit for power and be more patient. You know, where Kyle Hendricks feeds is off of aggressive. And where pitchers at change speeds get you is they know you want it. <laughs> like, you, you know, swing for the fence and you're aggressive and you're excited. Yeah. And we've seen this wholesale shift in baseball. Our guys are willing to go multiple plate appearances in a row without taking the bat off their shoulder. You know, or like, hey, I was 0 for 1 with two walks and a sack fly, and that's a great game in today's baseball. So those hitters are much harder for Kyle Hendricks to get out than somebody who's getting in the box like, all right, I got to get a fastball up. I'm going to drive mm-hmm. this fucking thing to, you know. Um, and it, it just the lack of aggressiveness, or I should say the diminished um, attitude of an early in the count when I get in the box, I have action on the first two, three pitches. You know, that used to be a thing. Early action, guy gets in the box, wants to get the first fastball, wants to get, you know, wants to get Ozzy and ever struck out. I mean, how many, Juan Pierre is a good example. Early action guys. Like those guys don't exist anymore in baseball. There's no mm-hmm. fucking early action, period. The guy who swings at a first pitch in today's game is crazy. So this is another long winded way of me digging into Kyle Hendricks and saying, I have to come around here. I just don't even know if the environment exists where you can Yeah, it's just so, a legit changing of the times. Let's stay. Can I I like this pitching staff conversation. So I just yeah. do want to get I want to get a little bit deeper for a second. Uh I'm gonna pull up some stats here. Now, one thing that jumps out with the Cubs pitching staff, they are better than they have been historically at striking guys out. So I've got some strikeout per nine up. Jordan Wicks has struck out a ton of guys this year. He's putting a lot of people on base, but there's going to be some give and trade there. You know, he's he, he's going to give up less hits. It's just part of the process when you throw a change up. You have to be over the zone with it. You have to challenge hitters. And so he's going to give up hits, but you're also going to see this trade off with strikeouts. Uh, Yancy Almate was included in the Dodgers trade for Michael Bush. He's a 29 year old reliever that the Dodgers got from Colorado. You know, just not really used that much. And he he got an opportunity early with the rain delay last Sunday against the Dodgers. Pitched well, and okay. he, he's throwing the ball. You know, I think okay. I think he's throwing the ball well enough to like maybe he can get hot. You know, that's an interesting name. Jed added him. He costs less than $2 million. Mark Leiter Jr. has been versatile. Javier Saad stepping up big time. Um, if we go down the rest of the list, so like Luke Little, I don't, how many lefties? We need a lefty. I don't know where that lefty comes from, but I would do anything to have a grizzled lefty coming on this bullpen. However, I'm just fine with where the bullpen's at. I want to be clear. I'm just fine with where this bullpen's at, even blowing eight nothing. And people need to calm down about the bullpen and trust that Jed and Craig are working on it. I trust in Jed and Craig. Hey, bullpen, I want to go start pitching though. Justin Steele, by the way, congratulations. Welcome to the Barcelona family. Steal the show out with Marty Mush. Awesome. Love the fact that we have a Chicago Cub guy on the podcast network. I would like to point out that he is rehabbing, could be back, hopefully sooner than later. That's much needed. But in the present time, we are looking to say, can we replace Kyle Hendricks? Would you rather replace him with a Jamison Tayon who's coming back, or would you rather replace him with Ben Brown now? You just say, fuck it, Ben Brown's a starter now. Or are you more comfortable just saying, Ben Brown, fill the Justin Steele starts. We're going to give Kyle Hendricks the ball another couple times. We're going to grit our teeth, wait for Jamison to come back. Where do you as a Cubs fan, like, what's your sensitivity to Pauline Henderson? Who would be the guy that you'd want to put in there? Just first glance, Ben Brown, just because he's had that kind of quiet start in a way. He's, you know, he's getting filling in on innings here and there. But uh, first first pulling the trigger here is Ben Brown. Yeah, I don't know if Ben, if ben Brown is going to be the Justin Steele guy. But then it's like, what's the timeline with Justin Steele to come back? Yeah. And then... Do you fuck with Ben Brown if you're like, hey, you're no longer the Justin Seal replacement guy. Now you're the Kyle Hendricks replacement guy. We're going to move you around too much. There is a lot of shuffling here. And I'll be honest, if Kyle Hendricks just wanted to go out and give us a quality start, one quality start, that would give us so much breathing room 
for the Justin Steele return for Jameson because we don't want to be pushing these guys into these. Hey, well, now we're, you know, we lost two in a row. We need Jameson to give us a good start. We want everyone kind of coming along and as we talk about this to. lineup. Man, get, get the most out of the, the environment that we've created with this good lineup. We don't be rushing stuff. We don't want to be too. What's be better for his ball. development from for Ben Brown's development? Like, what spot would he would you think he would should be in? His b- best spot for him would be Jamison Tayon comes back, and they six man and gradually Kyle Hendricks. You know, I don't know if he steps down. That's a conversation between the agent and the front office because there's no trade value for him. He doesn't have a spot on the team, so the ball will go back to Kyle and say, like, how do you want to handle the fact that you know we're going to DSA you or you're not going to be part of it. Hypothetically mm-hmm. speaking. Yeah, I totally. No idea. This. Developmentally for Ben Brown, you know, it, it should be a good experience for Kyle Hendricks. He should make it a good experience when he leaves. And if this is playing out the way I think it is, you don't want Ben Brown thrust in as a replacement. Like, all right, now it's your spot in the rotation as much as he's earned it. And I think council has done a good job of giving him these opportunities to build that confidence to be like, no, it's not like we're just giving it to you because you're a prospect. Like you've, you've shown us enough. We believe in you now go take the next yeah. step because very seriously, whether Ben Brown's smart enough to know this himself, someone's going to tell him, make it very clear to him. Hopefully he doesn't have to, hopefully he just knows this for himself. But I, my understanding is he's kind of a cocky prospect, kind of like he's, Got blonde, some blonde hair, just yeah, blowing in the wind. But, hey, buddy, if you're taking Hendricks father, okay, you know who that guy is, right? You know how many games he started for this team, and you know how many games he's pitched well for it. Like, this ain't no fucking joke. So if they're sending yeah. him back in and they're asking you to take this spot, like, dude, please do not be fucking around. Please do not be out at Bottle Blonde or, you know, closing down Maple and Ash. Like, if you don't mind, like, this is a very big deal. <laughs> so, um, other notes just about the pitching staff. I, we're getting long in the tooth here, but like I said, I wanted to get a little bit deeper like I had historically with the Red Line Radio Days because we have enough in front of us and we have enough behind us. We're starting to really get a feel and vibe of what this team's like. Um, I really want to emphasize how important it is that the Cubs are 4-1 and one since Justin Steele got hurt in game started where Justin C will get start and in the Javier Assad games. Because the reason I'm packaging up the number five into this and talking about Javier Assad here is because they pitch after each other. Assad pitches before the Justin Steele starts. So those two games are connected in the schedule. And that, when we say the Cubs' this team is not a team that can lose a lot of games over a stretch. Like, they're not going to go on a losing streak. Well, I can tell you where these losing streaks lie is, like, number five gets banged up. Your number one isn't out there. So whoever the hell is pitching for him, he gets banged up. Now we got Kyle Hendricks in the two spot. Then you have a rookie, Jordan Wicks, pitching after that. It's like, okay, we could very There's easily compounding. find ourselves. Yes. And then it's like, oh, roll forward into Shota. Okay, he's been great, but now you're going to... Like, freaks me out hearing that. It's like, okay, that's how quickly things can go wrong. Oh, uh, yeah. And just try to connect that for people. Like it, it's great. The lineup should help smooth things in the long run, so we don't see these these moments in the schedule. But the pitching staff is the starting pitching. We really could use one person to to really step up. I Shota's done it, but I'm not expecting him to be a Cy Young the entire season. All right, Mahoney, I got a stat I want to talk about. Please. And then we're going we're to talk about the week coming up. I think we're on a very good page. We're rolling. I'm chosen to do this Diamondbacks Carl Cast tonight. Now I got like the graphics and everything. Um, how are you doing? I just want to check in. I know you had a baptism today. We had a long week of travel. Just checking in on my, uh, checking in on my dad. I'm doing good, man. I'm not going to lie. I'm a little bit exhausted. So if you guys see my eyes going this way or the other, it has been a long week, long day, but I'm excited for Monday morning because it's the Monday morning Cubs show. So vibe check, feeling good. Saw Goose earlier. Really, it's been a great, great week. Um, Yeah, a little tie-tie, but I'll be okay. 
couldn't think of a better time to bring up bullpen leverage index, which is a statistic that me- measures uh, how many or what your frequency is of high leverage opportunities for your bullpen based on any appearance or whatever. Now, it's a factor, meaning it's 1.0 is, is considered neutral. If you are above 1.0, those are high leverage situations. If you are below 1.0, those are low leverage situations. That's a five-run lead. That's down by a 10. Those are meaningless. So the major league average for all relievers, 0.97, which makes sense. Some games and appearances don't really mean anything. And there's less save opportunities than there are seventh inning, you know, the Cubs register a 1.002 on the scale, meaning they have a higher leverage index. The bullpen has been asked to do more mm-hmm. than your average major league bullpen has so far this season. I believe it's the eighth highest leverage index in major league baseball and the fifth highest in the national league. And you're asking this leverage. Now, this, you know, it's only 15 games. We're 10th of the way through the season. But do you see studs and gangsters in this bullpen i don't i see guys that are getting opportunities and make the most of it like elzelay has been in this organization forever he was a starting pitching prospect surgery tommy john out back closer okay let's rock yeah. ball, baby. you know naris they spend money on and they are getting every day they're that motherfucker's pitching eight he looks tie good. Game one or, yeah that's why you spend the money on him so that you can go run his ass into the ground Mm-hmm. <laughs> they did the same thing with you when they traded for Chad. They just ran his ass in there. You get one of these veteran bullpen guys in here, knows what they're doing, just run his ass in the ground. So gives opportunities in. You look at Mark Leiter Jr. has done, done well. Mary Weathers was photographed doing some throwing sessions and stuff. There's no return t- timetable for Mary Weather yet, but you know, people are mad at Quays. He's he's like he's like bad, but you know, then it's an opportunity for Almani to step up. And I, I just think people should be real bullish about the long-term future of this bullpen. Even if they come out and they blow a couple games early, you really should just trust that Craig Council is going to understand better spots to manage these guys. They're going to come together over the season. And the fact that the team is good will build good bullpen culture. Yeah, totally. It goes back to, two, yeah, just the whole collective aspect of, of the squad. So if we can get a lefty, you know, some, ha- some help lefty, I will – it's hard to come by, obviously, but a shutdown left on left, you know, that can get righties out. You got to face three hitters at a minimum. We're very happy about the depth. Last thing about LZLA, I want to say four of his seven appearances have come in the ninth inning uh, with in a safe situation. He's got one of his seven appearances come in the eighth inning, and that was the Tatis homer. Miguel Amaya was catching that. It was a 1-0 slider. I would not have thrown a 1-0 slider to Tatis in that situation because he would be guessing 1-0 slider, and that's exactly what he did. Tendency says Alzelay against a good hitter, 1-0 on the count. In a situation where damage can happen, he's going to throw you a fucking breaking ball. Tatis was on it. So I'm interested if Jan Gomes calls the same pitch. I'm, I'm interested if Craig Council lets the young guys just go out there and figure that shit out for themselves. But you throw a 1-0 hanging slider to Tatis, he's going to absolutely hammer it. Sucked. Sucked losing an 8-0 lead. But if the end result out of that is Miguel Amaya and Elzelay are better off in those situations in the future, I'll take that ball right now. That means in October, when it really matters, um, we can make that trade. Does that make sense? It does, yes. He's only given up, in all his runs he's given up this year, but on home runs. He's given up two home runs. Walk stop, like he doesn't walk, guys. We're big on LSLA. Uh, Ema, I got 3 0. That's the last thing I have on pitching set. We're going to look ahead real quick here, guys. Please tune in tonight for the Diamondbacks. Carl right. Cast. Yeah, like Carl Cast, I'm very much looking forward to. We have, if you're watching on YouTube, we have this schedule for this week pulled up three at Arizona, four at home against Miami, two late night games. Now, the pitching matchups, Ben Brown and Merrill Kelly. Merrill Kelly's a right-handed pitcher with good stuff. Pitch and sink makes around his own. Kyle Hendricks versus Tommy Henry. Tommy Henry's a lefty from Michigan. He's okay. Cutter, curve. The Cubs should eat Tommy Henry's lunch game, too. So, Kyle Hendricks is a great opportunity. Put some shit behind you. Go down, beat Tommy Henry. 
And then we've got Jordan Wicks versus Brandon Fott, game three. I really like Wicks in a day spot because if day baseball is a good opportunity to strike a ton of dudes out, which is shown swing and miss stuff early. Comfortable pitching in Arizona weather, been down there two months to start the year. So, like, that's not a tough adjustment where I would say going out to Seattle is a little bit different if you haven't played in that ballpark. So, this Arizona matchup is interesting too. Arizona represented the National League in the World Series last year. They've got a bunch of young, dynamic players. It is a different team than the Cubs completely. They steal bases, they've got dynamic threats up and down the lineup. Super aggressive team and not nearly as patient as the Cubs. So you're just talking about a much more talented, uh, on paper, you know, explosive. And the Cubs are more your seasoned, savvy, fucking dependable for Taurus. The four games against Miami, we've got three left-handed. Come again, Mahoney? An interesting clash style-wise, right? Contrasts. Say that again off the top and like we haven't done it just because I'm going to edit this out. Style wise, just contrasts. Yeah, and I like these different contrasts early in the season. The Rangers is a good example of big contrast. The Dodgers, big contrast. Padres, big contrast. Huge, thunderous, kind of softball style lineup from the Padres. Mariners, pitch, catch it, you know. Beating Luis Castillo, Javier, is I going out and beat Luis, Luis Castillo in a rubber match game? That's insane. Like, that is every bit as impressive as the Cubs taking an early home series against the Dodgers. Beating Luis Castillo on a Sunday. Uh, yeah, that was big, dude, for sure. Nice way to end the week. So as we look ahead, very interesting thing about this week with these seven games. Four of these seven games are going to be started by left-handed pitching. Three in a row from the Miami Marlins. On paper, it says, Jesus Lazaro is going to pitch the Friday game. A.J. Puck, Hoop, Puck, whatever, would be pitching Saturday for the Marlins. Six, seven, big lefty from the University of Florida. Got drafted sixth overall by the Oakland Athletics and then uh, traded straight up for that dog shit outfielder from Vanderbilt. Sorry, I got a high threshold for Vandy guys. And then Ryan Weathers is going... Sunday looks like it's going to be Kyle Hendricks if he's still in that rotation on Sunday. That'll be very interesting. If he does not, if he gets his shit rock on Tuesday, would they DFA him before that home start? Would they get rid of him? Would they do something? Go to the IL maybe? Yeah, I could see something of that nature. I don't know if it would be this soon for DFA action. And then take a look this Thursday game if you're going to bet a Cubs game. I'm, I'm sure the odds are going to be substantially in favor of the Cubs. So this is like a minus one and a half or minus two and a half game. Max Meyer is pitching for the Miami Marlins. He's an early young righty from the University of Minnesota, about six foot, six one, 200 pounds. Very good athlete, explosive stuff. Just has not ever in his entire life pitched against a lineup like the Cubs. The Miami Marlins lineup has never seen a guy like Imanaga. The Cubs are going to have a ton of momentum. It's a Thursday night game. I have that certain for like, I'm going to sprinkle Cubs minus one and a half, minus two and a half. I'm going to play that thing every which way I can. That's the Thursday night game. Boom, so. Guys, this is the Monday Morning Cub Show. It has been detailed and long-winded. This has been a selfish exercise on my part because there's a lot of stuff I want to get off my chest about this team and build these narratives because the season's off and running. We know exactly what this team is now and what it can be capable of. So lock it, get jacked up. Like seven games this week. Three against the defending, you know, National League. You know, champs and four at home, three day games against the Marlins. I mean, they should. There's no reason that the Cubs can't go three and one in that four set against the Marlins. So let's have some fun in Arizona. That's how I feel. Yeah, let's have a week, Cubs fans. Um, anything you want to talk about? We just have this last category here. I put in this last. It could be 10 seconds. It could be one minute. Hopefully not any longer than five. With but, some of our travels, that could, that could have been an entire episode in itself. Uh, what a week. Thank you so much, Carl, for kind of taking us to water and bearing with me, you know, 
I'm in exhaustion state right now. I'm looking forward as well as getting back in the bunker next week. Um, I'm looking forward to this week just as a Cubs fan. Mahoney, I'm telling you, man, I've wanted to do stuff with you for a long time and content with you. We've talked about this for like 10 years. I don't yeah, say 100%. that lightly or anything. So it's it's easy. It's very easy to prep with this and for us to kind of scheme on how we want to go about a show or what we want to be putting out there. I have a lot of respect for dads. I have a lot of respect for family men. I told you primarily off the top that this thing has, has to fit around your family. Yeah, and dude, like, I appreciate my, that my wholeheartedly. Family. There's no like, what the fuck, dude? This this show is your family comes first, you come first, your whatever you have going in life. And so as we're talking today about the baptism, should I come out in the garage? Well, we did the garage show a couple of weeks ago and like families around. We don't need to do, we don't need to be putting the show into the baptism fucking like, yeah. scene. Well, there were talks initially you were going to come over and do the driveway episode in a suit and tie, but we, yeah, I didn't feel comfortable. On. Honestly, I just didn't feel comfortable doing that. So, um, and then obviously, you know, our trip to New York, I know how important if people aren't aware of this, Mahoney's favorite band is a band called Goose, the jam band from Connecticut. And they played the Capitol Theater, which is in Port Chester, New York. And Mahoney, you and I, we should sit down and do like a silly guess, goose a separate heads. thing. Seriously. What a trip. What a theater, what a venue. This is not really the platform to talk about, you know, our personal experiences and music and what makes it so special and daring but uh, when you won the ticket raffle and you're like hey I have two tickets it's random tuesday night it's in six days i would love to do this with you done we i talked to, took you to the dave matthews concert this past summer when i had an extra ticket and we started brainstorming about this show so when you're like hey this came up with you so go see capitol theater Oof. and the show i mean it blew me away but like I said, I'll go on and on and on and on about it. It was an unbelievable experience from start to finish. What a day. They could talk about the pizza for an hour, you know? Right. Seriously. Right. How about this? And we'll just encourage our audience and like you're, you know, you guys have your buddies in your life and stuff and things get fast and things, it's harder as you get older. So something, a, a big takeaway, I guess, from the experience or do it, do it, stuff, saying yes to your friends and finding those things that your buddies like really give a shit about and trying to be there for them for those things and endearing yourself to things your friends give a shit about because there's no better feeling than when one of your buddies is there for you or something you care about and they, they want to be a part of it. I've been on the receiving end of that so many times and like I think it's an important thing. It's fucking important, man. I don't know how much you like that band. I'm getting into. I, I've been listening to them for like a year, but I don't know. Yeah, you know, I know they rock. I know a ton of their songs, but it's like you love them. They mean a lot to you. Like they, and music can do that the same way baseball does. For sure, music's dude. always good, always there for you. It's not. You're not mad they didn't blow. <laughs> they didn't blow a lead. <laughs> Some people are pretty upset about the drummer switch, but that's that's what I think. We could talk about this for an hour. So why don't we do this instead? We'll just avail you to our, and say to the audience, say, guys, like, you know, if you're a big sider, you're a jam band or whatever, that's Mahoney style. I like a lot of music. All music, I should say. Very serious, serious too serious about music. But um, if you're a goose side, Mahoney's your guy. How's that? That's right. Cubs are nine and six. We have seven games this week. This is the Monday morning Cup show. It's April 15th. This has been an information heavy, Seattle report heavy, Barstool Carl in the weeds heavy, old school Redline Radio vibe show. A little bit kind of off the beaten path that we built with these segments, but our first remote, we're six episodes in. I cannot thank everybody for tuning in. Leave a review if you get a chance. If you don't, we don't give a fuck. Be honest. There's not going to be this big, like, you know, I'm going to build your house if you leave a five. You do whatever you want to do. If you are compelled and think that we're doing a good enough job or you you feel like this is worth it, fucking share it. If you don't, no, let's get off my back. I'm going to keep having a good time with this. And the video switchboard. Whew, Carl Cassidy. Ha.
We'll see you guys next time. Thanks for tuning in.